public reporting, uh, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser first called Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy to ask for help at 1.34 p.m. It looks now like the Capitol, the, the police... Yeah, now, Pete, let me break away from you a back. second because things are happening very quickly. According to your written testimony, you were, quote, aware that demonstrators had breached the Capitol. Welcome to Democracy Under Fire, a show that examines the threat to democracy and what people are doing about it. My name is Rich Proceda, and I'm the founder of the Truth and Democracy Coalition. Together, we will build a movement capable of saving democracy. I'm an author and writer, podcaster, and I speak and write about religion and politics. I studied law at American University in Washington, D.C., and I focused on constitutional law. I even wrote a book on foreign comparative constitutional law. I've been fighting to save democracy and defending the Constitution with increasing intensity since the Mueller report came out. I've been focused on the threat to democracy, not only posed by Donald Trump, but the threat posed by the massive dissemination of disinformation, lies, half-truths by major media networks, political parties, domestic politicians, and foreign governments. I've come to believe that we need a pro-democracy movement in America capable of bringing tens of thousands of people into the streets. To that end, I formed the Truth and Democracy Coalition. We work with other organizations to build a movement capable of saving democracy, to build the movement to save democracy. Today, we are working with a large coalition of groups, including Public Citizen, Faithful Democracy, and the Declaration for American Democracy. We are participating in the Finish the Job for the People Day of Action to demand that the Senate pass the Freedom to Vote Act and to end the abuse of the filibuster. The anti-majoritarian filibuster was meant to be hard to sustain, to prevent it from being abused. The filibuster must not be allowed to frustrate the will of the American people, or it must not, and it must not be used to dash Americans' hope in democracy. On January 6, 2021, the President of the United States incited thousands of his supporters, many of whom came armed and prepared for combat, to march down to the Capitol and fight like hell to stop the certification of the election. He told them some 20 times to fight in his speech. And I want to bring you back to the impeachment trial because I think that we need to see the evidence and remember what happened. And we need to remember every day what happened on January 6th. Here's Rep. Madeline Dean prosecuting Donald Trump. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. In a speech spanning almost 11,000 words, yes, we did check, that was the one time, the only time President Trump used the word peaceful or any suggestion of nonviolence. The implication of the president's tweets, the rally, and the speeches were clear. President Trump used the word fight or fighting 20 times, including telling the crowd they needed to fight like hell 
to save our democracy. We know how the crowd responded to Donald Trump's words, and he knew how they responded to his speech. Here is the evidence of how the crowd reacted. Yes. Storm the Capitol. Invade the Capitol. Fight, 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 fight. Take the Capitol right now. These were the words of the crowd. Trump was telling them to fight, and he would keep telling them to fight throughout the rest of his speech. These are not only words of aggression, they are words of insurrection. So they marched to the Capitol and fought like hell causing death and injury to Capitol Police officers. They defaced the sacred halls of Congress, causing two and a half million dollars in damage. They even smeared feces on the wall. They threatened the lives of our representatives. Had they succeeded, the American experiment in democracy could have come to an end a mere 245 years after the founding of our democratic republic. Trump spread lies and disinformation designed to mislead his followers into believing the election was stolen. So Trump anticipated he could lose the election. So he started sowing doubt about the election results before voting even started. He declared that there was no way he could lose and promised to contest the results. Here he is in a debate before the election. How confident should we be that this will be a fair election and what are you prepared to do over the next five plus weeks, because it'll not only be to election day, but also counting some ballots, mail-in ballots after election day. What are you prepared to do to reassure the American people that the next president will be the legitimate winner of this election in this final segment? Mr. President, two minutes. So as far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. A solicited ballot Okay, solicit it is okay. You're soliciting, you're asking, they send it back, you send it back. I did that. If you have an unsolicited, they're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud. They found them in creeks. They found some with the name Trump, just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. They sent two in a Democrat area. They sent out a thousand ballots. Everybody got two ballots. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. The other thing, it's nice on November 3rd, you're watching and you see who won the election. We won't know, we might not know for months because these ballots are gonna be all over. Take a look at what happened in Manhattan. Take a look at what happened in New Jersey. Take a look at what happened in Virginia and other places. They're not losing 2%, 1%, which by the way is too much. An election could be won or lost with that. They're losing 30 and 40%. It's a fraud and it's a shame. He filed more than 40 lawsuits, all of which failed. Let's remember what he said, because I believe on the e this eve of remembrance, we must remember that Trump also threatened violence should he lose. Here he is on NPR. Mr. President, uh, real quickly, win, lose, or draw in this election, will you commit here today for a peaceful transferal of power after the election. And there has been rioting in Louisville, there's been rioting in many cities across this country, red and your so-called red and blue states. Will you commit to making sure that there is a peaceful transferal of power after the election? Well, we're gonna have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about 
the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you commit oh, to making sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Uh, the ballots are out of control. You know it. And you know who knows it better than anybody else? The Democrats know it better than anybody else. Go ahead. Mr. President, the second question is, will you Please, go ahead. Why won't go ahead. He, why you asked the question. Why he spread false propaganda about the election and incited his followers to fight. He called them to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, promising that it would be wild. When they got there, some in combat gear, he, with the assistance of his lackeys like Rudy Giuliani, incited his militant followers to attack Congress and stop the certification of the election. Notice the twisted logic of Rudy Giuliani as he uses a lack of evidence to justify trial by combat. Who hides evidence? Criminals hide evidence, not honest people. So over the next 10 days, we get to see the machines that are crooked, the ballots that are fraudulent, and if we're wrong, we will be made fools of. But if we're right, a lot of them will go to jail. So. Let's have trial by combat. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore, and that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. It was a reckless gamble. They saw the people in combat gear. They knew their crowd. While their plan failed, it was a traitorous attempt to overthrow and end democracy in America. The insurrection was an attempted coup. A coup is a violent and unlawful seizure of power from a government. The people who attacked the Capitol were not patriots. They were deluded, thugs acting irresponsibly and carelessly, unwitting agents of foreign and domestic propagandists who seek only to overthrow American democracy and replace it with a dictatorship. While racism is a tool used by propagandists to cause division and to rile up their base, the real struggle is over money and power. Who will lead, or perhaps more accurately, who will own the richest and most powerful country in the world? That's what's at stake. Dictators like Vladimir Putin don't like democracy movements. At the same time, they don't want to kill their own people and destroy their own country. It's expensive and unpleasant. So they're looking for a solution. They have developed the technology capable of manipulating groups of people. That technology is propaganda, sometimes called messaging, the narrative, or public relations. Propaganda is a pervasive and powerful tool to influence attitudes and behaviors. Corrupt politicians disseminate false propaganda to raise money and to take power. The ongoing false propaganda about the election 
constitutes a direct threat to democracy, an ongoing attempt to overthrow our government. It is currently being used to justify laws restricting access to the ballot that are being proposed across this nation, more than 400 laws restricting access to voting. The coup attempt hasn't ended. It's just changed gears. Only we can defend the, co the Constitution. Only we can protect and fight for our democracy. We cannot put that in the hands of other people or foreign governments or politicians. Corrupt politicians and foreign actors must not be allowed to subvert our elections. We must set national standards to protect every American's fundamental and sacred right to vote. I am excited and very supportive of the Freedom to Vote Act. It takes the best intentions that we have for protecting our democracy and concretizes it, making sure that we have uniform standards across this country so that the quality of our democracy doesn't vary from geography to geography or based on your race. Stacey Abrams' endorsement of the newly revealed Freedom to Vote Act, a bill that now has the unique distinction of full Democratic support in the U.S. Senate, carries immense weight. Here's what's in the bill. It remedies restrictions by enabling all voters to request mail-in ballots and putting in place minimum standards to ensure that drop boxes are available to all voters. The measure also requires states to offer at least 15 days of early in-person voting to register eligible voters automatically with their driver's license and to offer election day registration. In addition, the bill sets reliable evidentiary standards to constrain the massive voter registration purges that are taking place in states such as Georgia. Crucially for in-person voting, the bill makes election day a holiday. It also targets Georgia's inhumane new legislation that prohibits individuals from providing water or food to voters waiting in long lines. Okay, so it does all of that and, and more. So what I'd like to do now is go over some of the Freedom to Vote Act and what's in it that hasn't already been mentioned. It's divided into three parts. It has voter access and election administration, election integrity, there is election integrity in it, and civic participation and empowerment. It, it makes sets hours for early voting so that people will be able to access early voting. It puts polling places on college campuses so that young people can vote. It prevents people from having to wait in line more than 30 minutes. It's atrocious all that time. People have to wait in line. They should never have to wait in line for the times that they have to wait in line. Same day voter registration. Uh, minimum standards for federal vote by mail and drop boxes ensures that voters can request the mail in ballot, improves delivery of election mail, puts in place standards to ensure that drop boxes are available and accessible. And it also has some voter ID requirements. Um, it requires a, it sets universal or national standards and a broad set of identification cards and things that people can use so that we don't have these restrictive ballot IDs. Like you can get a, you can vote with a NRA ID, but not with a student ID. That's, that's gone. So they're trying to mansion supports voter ID. So they're setting minimum standards so that people cannot use restrictive IDs to prevent people from voting. Um, the second section uh, establishes criminal penalties for people who are harassing or threatening or co coercing voters or undue partisan interference with election officials and state and local federal election administrators. So they're being threatened right now. And so this law addresses that. Paper ballots, a lot of people say we need a paper trail. Provides grants to states to provide new equipment and update their
their security. It doesn't allow the voting machines to be attached to the internet. They never wore, but anyway, criminal penalties for voter intimidation. And it prohibits false and deceptive statements by means of written, electronic, and phone communications. So I, that can be pretty big. There's a lot of false statements. And it prohibits states from criminalizing the donation of food and water to people in line. I mean, we did a lot of work that election to make sure that people were comfortable, that they were able to vote, that they, and we provided food, we provided entertainment. All this good stuff we did, the Republicans want to stop. So this stops them from doing that. It also establishes a duty to report foreign election interference, and both for campaigns and for the candidate's family. And then in Section 3, the part on participation has a lot of transparency rules, um, disclosure of funding, preventing super PACs from colluding with campaigns. So what we have to do is there's gonna be a push for the filibuster. And the filibuster can be modified in a number of ways. It can be changed. There's a number of approaches to take. Uh, they could make it a speaking. They could put time limits on it. They could remove it entirely. We just need one of those things to happen to pass this act. Now that we have all of the Democratic senators on board, we should expect them to pass that. And we cannot allow that resistance because the Republicans are inappropriately using the filibuster to block the Democratic Party's agenda, to block the will of the people. And we cannot allow that, as I said earlier. So we still need to call our senators to make this happen. We may be at the final stretch of this struggle to pass the Freedom to Vote Act, but it doesn't mean that our struggle is over. What it means is we'll be in a better position to defend democracy. We must not take democracy for granted. Democracy like the constitution and human and civil rights is something that we have to defend and fight for. Our democracy isn't perfect and we need to make improvements. So we must jealously guard our democracy and fight to make it more transparent and responsive to the will of the people. So like and subscribe our, to our channel, tell your friends about us. And if you wanna support the show and the Truth and Democracy Coalition, go to gofundme.com slash F slash democracy dash under dash fire. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very concerned with, the, even with Manchin on board, um, you know, he's the stumbling block here no matter what, because even though he's agreed to this particular uh, bill, um, you know, if we don't get rid of the filibuster or modify it drastically um, to get, you know, the threshold is still 60 senators. Um, and there's no way, um, you know, the, spe the uh, uh, Mitch McConnell has already stated publicly uh, the other day that he's not going to do anything for voting period. He's not going to support anything. So he's already, you know, in the same mode he's been in for five years, uh, which is obstruction and making sure that whoever is in charge is not going to be successful. They did it for most of Obama's term also. So I'm concerned about how are we going to get Manchin and whoever else? I mean, Kristen Sinema was on the list for, re, re, you know, re, being re, not responsive to getting rid of the filibuster. So my concern is the only way this can get done is to get rid of the filibuster, period. And there are so many senators that Amy Klobuchar has said it many times, so have many other senators about getting rid of the filibuster. And yet, you know, we got one person holding up the world here. And I'm going to blame him seriously if we lose our democracy. Uh, because he's really a, a boulder in the way 
of our democracy right now. That's all. Is that I mansion? Say. That's mansion you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and obviously Mitch McConnell and those guys, that side, right. but but mansion in particular. Yeah. Uh, well, all we right, have. Yeah. You. You're welcome. Thank you, Dwight. We do have all the senators on board for this. So I do expect this bill to pass, but there are other bills that have to pass as well. And if the Democrats can't deliver, I mean, why are people voting, you know, if we can't get things passed? And if we allow these silly rules, anti-democratic, anti-majority, because the Senate's already anti-majoritarian, each state gets two senators regardless of their population. So we don't need another anti-majoritarian rule on top of that. Jeffrey, did you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to offer that um, several legal scholars have ventured the opinion that the filibuster may actually be unconstitutional. <laughs> yeah, because it's anti-democratic. Okay, exactly. Jacob. It, it's unconstitutional. Yeah. And the thing is, it may be a little bit more palatable if it at least gets reformed. A lot of you have seen an old movie called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington starring Jimmy Stewart. And in the movie, the, the, he does a filibuster, but it's the old school kind where you have to go up to the podium and you have to start talking. And you're, you, if the moment you run out of gas, that's it. You're done. And that is the way the, his, the filibuster used to be done historically. I don't know if everybody realizes this, but these days, I think since the Gingrich uh, Congress, a filibuster consists of pushing a button. They don't even have to get up and speak. All they have to do is make an indication that they intend to filibuster. And that's as good as done. And that that is probably the most unconstitutional aspect of today's filibuster is they're not even speaking. They basically just phone it in. I'm going to filibuster and oh, it's done. Uh, he's going to filibuster. Let's just nothing to see here. Move along. And that that is the most flagrant violation of the Constitution. That's the most anti-majoritarian and anti-democratic aspect of the filibuster. If they had to go up and stand and deliver for, you know, four, six, eight, 12 hours or whatever, then it might be at least somewhat acceptable. So we got to reach the middle of the country. And I think the only way we're going to do that is one, by focusing on democracy, focusing on, and that's going to be next week's show, because there's a lot of people calling our vote sacred. Both sides think our votes, our right to vote is sacred. But they don't agree on what that means. And so we'll be doing that on the next show. But reaching out with uh, to the middle and even to the right, to, moder to more moderate people, because we're going to need the whole country on our side if we lose democracy, if we have to go into the street.